Well, that's my point. It's amazing <laughs> that this uh, person with his spirit was in the synagogue. Exactly. You know, it was uh, that the synagogue had all kinds of people in it. It wasn't some kind of segregated yeah. Yeah. group. This yep. was. Yeah, you're right. That's another interesting point. Yeah, amazing. Okay, can we start with a prayer? Lord, we had we had babies in church this morning. It was wonderful. Yes. <laughs> thank you for babies. And thank you for this congregation to to accept children and to nurture them for this mission and this calling that you've given us. This is such a great joy. Thank you for each other, where we can come together and talk and question and, and discuss and debate and sometimes disagree. You've given us the Bible, which has got all kinds of places to discuss and, and disagree over. Lord, it's a, it's a hard world now. There are people dying in, in, in Gaza and in Palestine and in um, and, and, and in Ukraine and all over in the Red Sea, forgive us. I mean, we didn't make that happen, Lord, but it is our world. And we have to live with it. And, and it requires all of us to repent. Bless us this morning as we turn once again to Peter, First Peter. It is such a joy to read this. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay. First of all, no class next Sunday because we have the annual meeting. That's right. Uh, don't want to get in the in the, in the way of an annual meeting. And they got all kinds of meal things going. And they got all kinds of eating stuff, right? That's a Presbyterian. Yeah. <laughs> Not all bad. <laughs> there are two things you do need for Presbyterian: the, the, the meals and cake. In the morning. Yeah. Cake in the morning. Cake that's right. in the morning. I mean, it's not up for cake at 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're we're going to... Uh, I'm sorry we missed last class. My I just had... My computer just wouldn't work. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Um, but it's it seems to be working now. I have... Um, when, we, when we left off... Uh, reading First Peter. Uh, we left off where, where he, he was talking about how you use about how the scripture, uh, the prophets were anticipating Christ. But even before that, bef that was just kind of sidelined. Just before that, uh, he th this is what, what he said. Uh, that um, That the uh, uh, although you have not seen him in, in a revelant of uh, Thomas, uh, the doubting Thomas, although this is verse eight, verse chapter one. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and uh, and, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an ind indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And we'll start now with verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, for it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke the Father as Father, the one who judges all impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. 
<laughs> that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of the perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living word, living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, well, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. Okay, I'm gonna stop here right now. When we get a little bit later on, we're, we're gonna we're gonna take a change. We're gonna go to one of these uh, household codes again. Uh, so we're in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a distinct part of Peter, and it is rich. I haven't finished it, and we may get to it some more. But this is just rich with with metaphor. And with biblical reference, uh, it is really quite wonderful when we get to it. And it goes deep into the history of, uh, uh, of, of the faith. And it what it does is defines who we are. And really very, very uh, powerful and potent terms. Um, it's, and it starts out by saying, uh, prepare your minds for action. What it really says uh, is gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> you can see that in a footnote, I think. Um, oh, yeah. And, and the, that's that's a common metaphor uh, in, in, in the Bible, gird up your loins. Yeah, where, where it comes from is that uh, folks wore long, long robes. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to start doing something vigorous or athletic or military like what you do is pull up pull up the rope uh, uh, from underneath and then tie it tie it up so that you kind of, kind of like wearing trousers so uh, what he's saying is get ready for it it's it's uh it's it's a uh, we're we're getting we're, we're getting into something here and this is redolent of the uh of the exit yes I see Mary is running. Oh, Mary. Hi, Mary. Oops. Thank you. Um, this is this is redolent uh, of not the Exodus, but the Exodus. Um, in, in, in Exodus 12, um, God tells the uh, Moses tells the people or to, to prepare yourselves. Uh, and in the first month of the year, you shall repeat this. Um, and, and and he talks about uh, Killing the lamb, and and he said, finally he says, this is how you shall eat it: your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. So this this is kind of reflects it. We'll get a little bit more specific about the Passover a little bit later. And then he goes on to say, well, first of all, I'll point out that uh, this is set set your hope. You've got a goal here. Uh, and on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring will bring you when he is revealed. Once again, this is the, 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 the scheme in First Peter is very strong that um, we're at the, we have a beginning of an age and an end of an age, and then Jesus is going to come, and that's when it all happens, when all this stuff happens. We, we, we receive it, we've got it. But it's going to be revealed to us at uh, it's going to really happen when Jesus is revealed. Mm. So that's that's a little different from what com many people's common theology is. The expectation is that uh, that this this grace and this all this feeling and whatever is going on is 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 going to be revealed now in this life. 
And then he says, like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Okay. Uh, what, what he's talking about is, is that you have come into a new stage of life. Uh, and he's talking to Gentiles here, and we'll see that more clearly later. He's talking to Gentiles. He's saying, you have been introduced into a new thing. Don't cling to the past. You know, let it go. Uh, then you were ignorant. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, this is one of these deep dives into, to, into the, uh, the, the, the history of Israel. In Leviticus, uh, Leviticus, you get Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, uh, Leviticus, uh, and then Deuteronomy. Uh, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Right. Leviticus is, is this wonderful, difficult book about how you do uh, sacrifices and how you robe up your priests and how you do this and how you do that from the ritual perspective. Uh, and it is um, uh, quite, it's, it's some of it's really, it, we have a lot of what we follow ethically and, and morally comes out of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. There is a whole code that we call the holiness code. And it starts in chapter 16 of Le Le Leviticus. Uh, and it is the, um, that's chapter 17, it goes from 17 to 26. But I'm going to read you a uh, part from 11, which is a precursor to it. Um, you shall not defile yourself. This is starting with 43. You shall not defile yourselves with them, that is with the people in the land, and so become unclean. For I am the Lord your God. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming creature that moves on earth, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Uh, to be your God, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so this, uh, you shall you shall be holy, for I am holy, is part of this, the, the warp and woof of Leviticus. Now, in Leviticus, it's a little different, because uh, most of it, uh, a lot of it, has to do with ritual purity. Um but we're getting into something different here in, in, uh, in First Peter. Move from ritual purity, where, you, you, I mean, you, you bathe, you, you wash, you, you, for ritual purity, to, to wipe off the ritual, uh, the impurities that you have gleaned, uh, that, you have, that are attached to you by virtue of things that you've done or places you've been, that you've touched something you shouldn't or ate something you shouldn't. This is that that's that that's the kind of impurity that that people focused on so much that Jesus had to say it's not what goes into your mouth, it's what comes out of your mouth. That 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 is important. So uh so this goes all the way back to Leviticus. Um, but it's something deeper. It's something deeper. This this um uh holiness code is I am for I the Lord and your God and holy, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God and holy. It's found in Leviticus 20 and 26 and 21 and 22. It's, it's just all throughout it. So how can we be holy? Ah. You know, this is uh, I know. great words, but that's, that, that's, how can we be holy? Absolutely. Exactly. You know, washing ourselves this is going to make us holy. He talks about that a little bit later here. Yeah. Because that's that's the thing. How do you how do you be holy? Um, so, if you verse seventeen, if you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. Now, uh, just once again, uh, we have a judgment according to our deeds. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's that 
enough to make anybody fear. This reverent fear now is not the is not the terror, you know, you just struck down with fear. This is the kind of fear that makes you realize that if you stand in the presence of God, you're toast. Uh, it, it's it's not uh, it, it's it's a judgment, but but it, it, it's an automatic judgment um, because you know verse eighteen, and this is pretty long. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways you inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that of a a lamb without defect or blemish. All right. Um, this is, first of all, we talk about the atonement here, the ransom. You're ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. Um, the, um, uh, this is a theory of atonement. Question comes in, uh, and it comes, it's coming frequently, and over the years, there have been scores of speculation about just exactly how this atonement happens. Mm -hmm. This is one theory. This is the ransom theory, which says that um, uh, basically uh, uh, yeah. we are in the hands of Satan, and we have uh, uh, a, a ransom has been paid to get us out of Satan's hands. By Jesus. Yes. And, and he notes that ordinarily ransom is paid in cash, gold, and stuff like that. This incidentally, this is a this is a, 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 just an ordinary political um and, and common part of life all the way up to the current time. People people are taking ransom in the hill for for one reason or another, mm -hmm. uh, usually cash, but not always cash. Uh, people are ransomed for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and so this is one theory. Uh, I am not an expert at ransom theory, and it's pretty abstruse sometimes. But nonetheless, uh, it's real clear that what's happened is because of the sacrifice of Christ, and once we're going back here to the precious blood that we don't like, uh, the precious blood of Christ. And, and here it's explained a little better. And we've talked about it before. Like that of a lamb without defect or blemish, which is exactly what was selected. What, what, what the people were told to take in their house, uh, a lamb without blemish, uh, and they were going to eat it. Uh, and that's the lamb. It's the sacrificial lamb. Uh, and that that is also part of the sacrificial process that develops from, from uh, uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, the process of sacrifice, and it's without blemish. Why? Because he don't want to give God the second choice. I mean, they were supposed to sacrifice? I thought they were trying to get stopped sacrificing. No, and here, keep, this... Keep with this, the, the, yeah, we got, yeah, this is, he's using, this is the deep dive, the deep metaphors here. So we are ransomed, not with gold, but by the sacrificial lamb, uh, by the sacrifice of Christ. Okay, so Christ. this is just a, a metaphor for what Christ did for us. Yes. But in this time when Peter was writing, were they still, were Christians still sacrificing? No. No, no, that, that was... No, the Christians have given that up right, already. Right, the, the, they have that in their ancestry, oh, especially yes. if they're Jewish. Well, not only they're Jewish, but oh. that's the kind of thing that also happens in pagan society. Okay. Animals okay. are sacrificed regularly. Okay. Sometimes by the hundreds. Okay, um, I see. So when I mean, you got a big so, coronation, they had they had a thousand oxen or something like that. So everyone so, would understand that. Everyone would understand yeah. that. Okay. Yes. As whether it's a, a propitiatory item, whether it's a sacrifice for the sake of somebody else, mm. that's purely Jewish. The mm. sacrifice in, in pagan in, in pagan rites is not uh, for the uh, for the benefit of somebody else. It's so that you can propitiate the gods. 
you can make them feel good. Um, so, and what they would do, incidentally, um, in the sacrificial system, is that meat? Well, it's they eat it. Yeah. So also, also feeding. There was a source. A ton of their it, people. It was a major source of protein. Yeah. Um, was well, the sacrifice it, days yeah. or festivals? And this is exactly one of the major questions. Uh, do can we eat meat from a sacrifice? Oh. And this is addressed several times in Paul's letters. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. So, so did he answer, say no? I yeah. can't remember. Did yeah, Paul say it. no? Yeah. Okay. And I think it's in also in, in, in um, Acts 15 and then Jerusalem Council, don't eat uh, meat, which is sacrifice. But, okay. So, um, so then in verse 20. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Mm. Okay, we're talking about uh, a, a, an understanding history that begins with creation, uh, and Jesus was selected before creation. Um, he was destined before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and he has come at the end of the ages, right? yeah. uh, and this is before the next age. Yeah. So we're talking about the span from before creation to the end of the world as we know it. This is um, just as, as one of the foundations of Christian theology. Is that Jesus is God, right? He was their creation, uh, and he was uh, is part of Jesus and God's God participated in the creation. That is most powerfully stated in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and in right. so that that. That is the essence, the really elegant statement of this theology. But it's also very late. The Gospel of John is probably 90 or so. So there are a lot of folks that would like to say, well, this is very late. And this is a, 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 an evolution in theology that John articulated. And it wasn't there early on. Actually, it's exactly the opposite. It was there early on. We see it in Paul. We saw it in, in 2 Corinthians. We see it in Paul. Uh, the, this notion that from creation, uh, Jesus was there. Uh, uh, and uh, what, what it appears to me, as I've been thinking about this, and I just really realized it today, uh, that John, when he wrote his thing, wasn't creating doctrine. He was articulating what was already there. He was did and he did it in such a powerful poetic form mm -hmm. that it just cemented it into, into, into Christian theology in a way that 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 we resist any attempt to ignore it. This this notion of Jesus was God uh is the feature that divides us from Islam and Judaism. Mm -hmm. That's the part that they can't 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 stop. So um, and, and it and it begins early. It really is an early doctrine. It's just not articulated so elegantly until John. Um, so uh, and once in, once again, we're talking about. Uh, a, a, a history of salvation that that is really is finds its its great crescendo, its great event happening at the end of the age. At the end of the age, not now. The rest of us, we struggle now. Uh, it's not a redeemed world. That's going to happen later. So, uh, in verse twenty one. Through him, you have come to trust in God, 
who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now, this is another um, critical element of Christian theology. Uh, and it's one that is sometimes discussed or not, you know, people don't, some some don't like to think about it or don't like to talk about it. It's essential to being Christian. We have a hope. And hope is established on the resurrection. Um, and that's that's exactly what we see in Paul. Uh, it's, it's, it's very strong in Paul. You know, and I am persuaded that that, that Paul saw this resurrected Christ uh, uh, there on the on the Golan Heights on the way. Oh yeah, you can go ahead. You go ahead. I got I got to change the uh, battery in one of your full cords. Oh. The bathroom one. Well, let me see. I don't know if you want to remove that yet. Oh yeah. Carol, are you talking? Carol, yeah. Okay. Um, that 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 Paul saw this Paul, Jesus on the road on the road to Damascus up there, and he said, "What does that mean? What does this mean?" And he then began to develop this theology from it because if it doesn't mean anything except this resurrected ghost walking around, then it's it's really meaningless. And so he is the one I, I persuaded that just caught into this, understood it, and he developed it over his over his mission and ministry so that he uh, 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 could articulate this in a way that goes beyond just an event of this guy getting crucified. So, yes. One more question about the, the reveal. Um, so in 20, he was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed, but was revealed at the end of the ages. So at the end of it, already he was revealed? Yes. When he came? Yes. At the end of the first group of ages. And well, now we're in the second group of ages. No, no. well, that's, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for, we have, the first we have, deadline have, came and went and Jesus didn't come. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's well, right. he did come, but then he left. But yeah. he didn't, and, but he didn't come back yet. And yes. so they said, this is the end of the first ages. Well, see, so you know, when you're talking ages. about the end of the first ages, yeah. what's, what you've done is this is a post- Non parousia problem. Yeah. And so okay. since he hasn't come, we have created a series of ages. Okay. And that's not really in the Bible. Okay. According to this, uh, there's, a, there, there's the creation, and this is the age of the earth, and right there at this very end, Jesus is revealed to us. Was revealed, it says. Was revealed. Yeah. yeah so it. it already happened. Yeah, I know. Okay, but that's, then that's, also he's going to come back. He's going so it's going to be back. another yeah. reveal, yeah. a separate reveal. I said, well, yeah, it's going to be the culmination. It's going to be the transition to the new age. Okay. Same. So there are not, if you look oh. at dispensationalism, there are eight ages, I think. Oh. Six or eight, it depends on. Okay. There's an age of, uh, of Adam and an age of Abraham and an age of... Uh, uh, of, I guess the Exodus, and I don't even count all that. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to. But I, I just was trying to say why it says was revealed. Because he was. Yes. He indeed. came here and walked around the world. Exactly. But they keep talking about another second that, coming. It hasn't, second coming. Yeah, the yeah. second coming is the new age. And we're still waiting. Yeah, we're still waiting. Still waiting. Haven't gotten there yet. Got it. But we have developed that into uh, an age of the church. For instance, uh, the uh, uh, that that's in some theologies, particularly in these apocalyptic theologies, um, these end times theologies. There are a series of ages, and uh, and, and that's what we're waiting for this end of this age. And I think we also talk about God being here with us yes. all the time. So yes, so that that's where the Holy Spirit comes. 
Thank goodness. Yeah. Sure. That we are not left alone. The Holy Spirit is here among us. Uh, and for some, that's a stronger presence than others, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So why is he talking about the grace that is coming? Because the grace was already here and given to us. Because the it culminates with the second coming, with the entry into the new age. So it becomes a world of grace uh -huh. rather than individual guys' grace. But the other the part about that is that the 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 resurrection as, as that we are to participate in, in in ordinary in most New Testament passages, in most New Testament considerations, that resurrection doesn't happen just when we die. That resurrection happens when Jesus returns. So uh, we're talking about a future uh, culmination of a world of grace that not going to happen before Jesus returns. And he's going to get into that because one of the characteristics of that means is that this is a hard world. Um, and, and so he he's going to, Paul's, Peter's going to talk about suffering uh, later in First Peter again. Yeah. How, do you, how do you maintain life in a world like this? Uh, so, uh, verse 22. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, um, uh, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. Um, here is the, uh, the purity notion, but it's not the ritual purity. It's an inner purification that, that, that Peter's talking about. It's a purification of our souls, our, our insides, in a way that, uh, that, the, that the law anticipated, uh, but never reached. Um, the, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, um, the, the, no more will you follow the law, but you will have you know, seed in your hearts. Um, it, 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 they, the, the Jews realize that this didn't happen, isn't happening the way it should be happening. Uh, and that's, that's uh, real clear there. So uh, that you have genuine mutual love, and so therefore you should love one another. Two different kinds of love here. You have this Philadelphia. Uh, Phileo is, is one of the kinds of love, there are several kinds of love, and agape is the other. Phileo, Philadelphia, which is love, brotherly love. So by virtue of having your souls purified uh, in a way that it is, we have a, a, a love and support for each other that is, um, that is deep, but it's not the same as uh, the love that he is calling us to here to have. Uh, have this deep love one another deeply from the heart, which is a kind of love where uh, it's not for your benefit, <laughs> and it's that it, nobody earns it. It's it's entirely freely given. That's this this agape is the basis of grace. Uh, so that he's calling us. Calling the church, calling the church, it was the exiles here to a higher level of love, uh, the kind of love that God has for us. It's, it's a, um, and, and he says that results. That's a, the, the, the brotherly love results from the, 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 the from, from the purified soul that we have. And he's calling us to take one step further with each other, which is a love of grace. When there are church fights, this other love falls away. And it's that's why it's so painful. Uh, destroys everything. Verse 23. You have been born anew, 
not of the perishable, uh, the perishable seed, to, uh, not, of, not of the perishable, but of the imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Four, all flesh is like grass and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And that word is the euangelion, the good news that was announced to you. Now you've heard this, you heard it this morning. Uh, all flesh is grass, but the word of the Lord faith and uh, fitness, the word of the Lord endures forever. There's a double encounter here. Um, he says in verse 23, you've been born in this a born again experience he's talking about. Uh, well, not you have been born again, not the not necessarily the experiences people define it, but you are somehow changed uh, so that you're in a different worldview, not of the perishable, but of an imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Now, uh, the, the, the real clear endurance, uh, the real clear double and thunder here is the word of God is Christ mm -hmm. on the one hand. And second, by citing uh, Isaiah here, uh, all the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That's clearly uh, was at the time a written word or spoken word, uh, but uh, it's also Christ in this. So this brings uh, the two, uh, they're not conflicting uh, understandings of the word, but I think, I think it's a, I wish God had done it another way. Give, Given, given this, this Jesus word is one name and then this is the spoken word is something else to keep it from being so confusing. Right. And in the beginning, was yeah, the word. Yeah, in the beginning. Yeah, so the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, uh, uh, it, it is, it is a, uh, it is a part of uh, understanding who we are that really it expands things. It, this notion of a, a spoken word, we kind of take it for granted. Mm -hmm. But a spoken word is, can be a command. Even in Egyptian, we have an Egyptian writing, the text word that, that God commanded the world to be created. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, and, and when you live in a society like Roman society, which is very authoritarian, very clear authorities, when somebody up there tells you to do something, that's going to happen. So um, that, that there's a power in words. It's beyond persuasive. It can be oppressive, uh, and it, can, it demands um, obedience. We see that now in politics sometimes, mm -hmm. where the, the, the political word is said, and people will obey it, period. Uh, I'm told, I've been reading, that uh, uh, the, uh, the Congress is has before them the, the order to not do a, um, a, a, a bill on immigration. Uh, and, and some somebody said that word, and others are going to obey it. Yeah. Um, so, this morning too. Yeah, that's a. Uh, it's very scary. So there's a power in the word in itself when you're in an authoritarian society, which this was. Mm -hmm. But there's also, and that's what happens when God commands the world to be created. And that's, the world was created through the word. But this word is also something else. It's, it's this incarnation. Jesus is the incarnate word. Now, uh, there is in the Greek world, um, the word is that it is the rational or rational facility. So um, it's, 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 it's a, and that, that gets mixed into the biblical use of the term word. So it's uh, rational faculties, ability to reason. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a reasoning process and that's from Greek philosophy. Um, so, 
Uh, so we're endorsed forever. And I'm going to read. Uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna, how far I'm going to get. I'm only got 20 minutes here. Same. Um, chapter two. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and slander. Is it just didn't stop all this stuff, folks? Mm -hmm. uh, Darn. Uh, uh, we have been uh, purified, our souls have been purified. Apparently, it doesn't stop us from being human uh, because there's a little guile, insincerity, envy, and slander, and malice going on out there. And he says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now, the, new, the NIV says, for indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. I'm not sure. Which, oh. I mean, that, that makes more sense. If, uh, or since you have indeed tasted that the Lord is good. Here's something that's interesting. In, in, in Paul, when he talks about milk, spiritual milk, basically, he's talking about immaturity. You were, I fed you milk before now that you mature, I'm gonna feed you. You need, you need to grow into mature food. This is something else. This is uh, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it, you may grow into salvation. Understand what this says? This says that being a Christian is not a status. It's a growth process. Uh, you don't arrive at being a Christian. You grow into it. And that's a much more satisfying um, uh, and, and, and seems to me rational understanding of what it means to be Christian in life rather than having this conversion experience and being this and now you're that and everything's fine over here because we all, uh, rather, this is the kind of thing where you're, you're, you're Working. Uh, you, you, you have this worldview change and you have to grow into it. You have to understand it. You have to modify it. And you just don't, it's not all there instantly. It's rather a part of the process that goes through all our lives, I think. I, I would hope that we never stop growing. Um, so, um, if indeed you have tested that the Lord is good, tasted that the Lord is good. Now, we're getting into um, the um, uh, a really rather remarkable set of uh, uh, metaphors here that fed into deep roots. Um, verse four, come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like the like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For, for it stands in scripture, see, I'm laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believes he is precious, but uh, to you then who believes, believe he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes sand, a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now this, I see I lay a, lay a, uh, uh, I'm laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone. Uh, this is um, right out of um, Psalm 18, stone that the builders rejection, 1822, has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord saying, it is marvelous in our eyes. And then Isaiah goes on and says, now, eight, 
For the Lord spoke thus to me while his hand was strong upon me. Do not call conspiracy all that the people call this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what it fears were being dread. But the Lord of hosts, him he's talking in a time of great stress in, in people uh, when they're under great duress here. Now, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. That is to say, respect God. I mean, of all these the threats upon you right now, I mean, the one that you need to really worry about is God. Um, but the, uh, he will become a sanctuary, a stone one strikes against. For both houses of Israel, he will become a rock one stumbles against a trap and a snare for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and they shall fall and be broken. They shall be snared and taken. Okay. What we have, and this um, is um, uh, found also in, 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 in the New Testament and some places, this, this, this metaphor, a cornerstone, a land of cornerstone, a rejected cornerstone. That is found multiple times in the New Testament. It is a major metaphor for Christ because he was rejected. Mm -hmm. Now, now, this is the, um, uh, he, he's, ex he's expanding that to, to make us, to make you living stone. Um, this is uh, uh, come to him, a living stone, Though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house and be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. This is temple stuff. Uh, this is the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem was world renowned for being an imposing structure. Uh, and this is the, the kind of, um, 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 he, he's saying that we can become a temple, and he's using this kind of metaphor to talk about giving, uh, doing spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And this is relying on the, the, old, the old metaphor, the old, old, old way of doing things, but he's changing it. He's changing it. I'm laying in Zion a stone, cornerstone, chosen and precious. Uh, and, and that's us. So that's both Christ, but he's calling us to be this as well, as a church, as a people. Mm -hmm. But it's also, Jesus has also become a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. For the people who do not believe. More than that, yes, for the people who do not. Oh, that's what it says. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. In First Corinthians, really powerful statements. All I hope I can call it up here. I didn't think to, to look it up before the chat. I just realized this is something already in there. In First Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about coming to come, <laughs> but uh, Jesus Christ and preaching only Christ. Jesus Christ has been crucified. Um, but it's so um, so in Red Corinthians 1 18, he comes and he comes and say, I came to you preaching Christ and him crucified. Nothing more, right? And then he says in verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As far as it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of, uh, of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe that Jews demand signs and the Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews 
and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. That's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and um, this same notion is being incorporated here, here in, in, the, in the first page. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now here we have, and this is the, this is where we'll stop with this here. Verse nine. Oh my God, I didn't finish reading. See, I'm laying that in verse six now. It stands in scripture. See, I'm laying in Zion, cornerstone, in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. But then, but to you then who believe he's precious, but to all those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. This is this predestination notion that, that John Calvin would love, but uh, John Wesley hated. So... And then it says, and this is as elegant as it gets, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. This was statement, uh, you are a um, uh, God's people. You are God's, uh, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Um, that is um, right out of um, uh, Exodus. Mm -hmm. Uh, Exodus 19. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, You, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and Keep my covenant, you shall be in my treasure, you shall be my treasured possession out of all peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is, in, is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. You're chosen. Yeah. And Isaiah 61 6, you shall be called priests of the Lord, you shall be named ministers of our God. Mm -hmm. This, this is the designation, this is the, the role of the people of Israel under the Old Covenant. They are a nation of priests. Now, Peter here is writing to the Gentiles. They are, they, they, their life is, is in exile now. They, they, they haven't yet arrived at the kingdom because that's going to be the end. They are exiles. Uh, but he says, you are, uh, you are now, now uh, a, you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty, uh, uh, the, the, the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he is taking this appellation, this function, they have a duty now and, and, and to, to proclaim the mighty acts of God. Uh, this now is placed upon the Gentiles. That, that would have been so foreign, right, to some Gentile if they weren't brought up Jewish, which they weren't. Well, but Would that have been they would have understood. It. They would have. Okay. Because these folks read the Bible a lot, and, and the, even if they were Jewish, even though they weren't Jewish, because first of all, the the basic scripture in the New Testament 
is the Old Testament. Uh huh. Okay. So these folk read it. Uh, and it's actually scripture not in Hebrew, it's in, it's in Septuagint, it's Greek scripture. So these folks were reading scripture, and this would give them, uh, they would have known that, okay, this in, 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 in Exodus is a label for the people of Israel. We are a new people. We are the inheritors of this calling to the people of Israel. And so that's, um, then they would have understood that. Okay. Um, so then um, it, it goes on one further. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you shall receive mercy. That's a um, uh, uh, right out of Hosea. The, the Hosea um, was a um, 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 what was the second, probably he was a contemporary of Amos so one of the two earliest prophets he was a prophet to the northern kingdom, we've not read any of those before or rarely, but uh, he was charged to go and marry a prostitute and then he had children and uh and in Hosea 1 9, the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Uh, and then uh, that's in Hosea 1. And then another child comes in Hosea 2, and he said, And I will sow for myself in this land, and I will have pity on Lo Wuma. And I will say to Lo Ami, you are my people, and you are my God. And, and, and you, he shall say, you are my God. This is, this is a statement of, uh, of redemption that, that has its roots in, in ancient Israel, in, in 700 BC, the 8th century BC, uh, where they are rejected and they become not people of Israel. You are not my people, but that's but they are they are redeemed. And this is what is what is talked about here. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a complete uh, incorporation of the Gentiles into the in, into the church. So it's just amazing that it's very poetic. Oh, yes. But, but this, it's coming from a very simple man with no education. We don't know. Fishing. Well, yeah. And we see, this is, this is one of the reasons why people say Peter didn't write this. Uh, but it's very possible that see, he was sitting around well, with his. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's extraordinary. Uh, it's, it's, it yeah. seems to be extraordinary. But Titus, uh, not Titus, uh, uh, with his Alan, his scribe, and they sit around and talk about this all the time. And this becomes part of their discussion who we are, what does this mean, what does this passage mean? And it's possible that when Peter was citing this, he would say, you know, this is this is right out of. Uh, uh, this is the puzzlement. This is this is what the Exodus tells us. You know, you know, late nation of prince, and and we see also it in Hosea. Write that down. You know, so it doesn't have to be Peter actually writing it. No, but he was familiar with scripture and would have been more familiar with scripture now than he was in Jesus' time. But he had with a different picture of him. So it could have been Peter. Maybe not. A lot of scholars think for that reason it wasn't. I think it could have been. Well, but the word of the Lord and 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 the he, he was there from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, for, for functional purposes, it doesn't make any difference. No. Uh, it doesn't. It's very different from Paul. Very different from his. Oh uh, well, that he's got he's. He, he's in sync with Paul. He'll mention Paul a little bit later on. Um, um, but um, 
it's um well, he's also writing to a different group a yeah. little bit right yeah yeah so so here's the royal priesthood then the builders that rejected the stone yeah and that's how it came open then to the gentiles well yeah yeah, and part of part of the the, the the underlying message is the Jews didn't get it right. You got it now. Mm -hmm. That well, seems the Jews to be... wouldn't listen to us, so we're going to the Gentiles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the interesting thing is that in fact the Jews that's where the church started in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and Paul was a Jew, and somebody, Peter some of them might must have listened. Yeah. They had the remarkable things of how fast the church grew. Yeah. yeah. So, resistant. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No class mm -hmm. next Sunday? Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? So, how do we become holy? I, how do you become holy? Yeah, that was the starting of. That's right. Well, it's a process, step by step. I think, the beginning I think of chapter two. We, 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 we have the option, we have step the possibility of getting one more holy. Growing process. Growing. <laughs> oh, and oh, and, and they don't say sense. that this is where you've got to be. Pardon me? God does not say this is where you have to be to be to be pure and holy. It's it's the striving and getting there. Yeah. That, 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 that seems to be the message here, Peter. Holiness is uh, as a nation, the church is holy, uh, the holy Catholic Church. Uh, but we all know that the church ain't all that holy. Uh, so, prayer in, in First Peter, uh, Second Peter, that this is not where we're supposed to be. That's going to happen at the end of the age. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Bye, Bye Carol. This will look at something. You have trouble walking this morning?